Hello to everyone under the tent and right here in the auditorium. A year ago, we were in level five and we were completely confined to our homes. We were like, what on earth has happened? What's happening in our world? And some of us here at Hope Church then decided to make banners and we put banners up outside our homes. I have a photo of our family exactly a year ago today on Easter. I remember Nathan, our son said, mom, People aren't even allowed to go for a walk in the neighborhood. Who's gonna see our banner? <laughs> I'm like, somebody's gonna see our banner. How much has changed? But things are looking better. Numbers for COVID are down. And you know, in January, actually, in 2021, our whole family got COVID. We were like, no, we have COVID. <laughs> and we were in isolation the first two weeks of January, and then our son turned 16, and he had COVID with his mom and his dad, and he was locked up (laughs) with us. The only people we saw were the people who brought food, dropped it at our door, and ran away from us. Um, That was pretty much his 16th birthday. But then yesterday, we were able to celebrate his birthday at Kaiman's with his friends, and... I see Cade is here, hello Cade. Was there enough pizza? There was enough pizza? That was my biggest concern because 16 year old boys eat quite a lot. Actually in the week one night I cooked and when Paul came home there was no food for him. I was like, I promise you I made a lot of food. I just, (laughs) mom we're hungry. But we just ate, mom that's an hour ago. So that's how it's going in our house. But we will continue to celebrate life. So we celebrated his 16th birthday because Jesus has risen. It's the foundation of our faith that our Lord is the resurrected God. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was mocked. He was hung on a cross to die a slow painful death. He died. He was dead. He was crucified. And they took his body off the cross and they laid his body in a tomb and they rolled a big stone in front of us and even put guards there. All hope was lost. His friends scattered. But heaven started to count to three And on the third day, his buried body started to breathe and the ground began to shake. Death could not hold him down and he rose and he rose victoriously. And when Jesus walked out of that tomb, the word impossible was erased from our vocabularies forever. Nothing is impossible for him. He's Lord of all. He reigns completely. And we often can make the mistake and remember Jesus as a helpless baby in his mother's arms. Or we can remember Jesus as a defenseless man hanging on a cross. We need to remember Jesus as a risen savior. Jesus is strong. We serve a strong God. All power comes from him and there's absolutely no one like him. Today, we are going to look at what Jesus actually did that very Sunday that he rose from the dead. So so he he just rose from the dead. What does he choose to do? That's very interesting. So we're going to Look at Luke 24. What happened is these two disciples, Cleopas and another one, we don't even know if it was a lady or a man. They're not really known. They're pretty much just two ordinary people. We're walking on the road to Emmaus, a, an insignificant small town. And what happened is <laughs> they actually lost hope. They packed their bags. They were going back home because Jesus died. But then Jesus came and he decided to come and walk with them. They actually didn't know it was Jesus until later in the story. But think about it. Wouldn't you expect something a bit more dramatic from the King of Kings who just raised from the dead? Like he could have appeared 
in any high court and said, see, I am who I said I am. <laughs> but that's not what he did. Earlier that morning, some women went to the tomb and when they got there, they realized that Jesus wasn't there. The tomb was empty and angels appeared to them and the angel said to them, he's not here. He has risen. Jesus is alive. Hope is alive. And these women went to tell all the other disciples who told other people and they told everybody and everybody was just confused because it sounded like nonsense. What are these women saying? I mean, how could he be alive? And rumors started to spread all over Jerusalem that maybe somebody stole his body. His body was gone. Maybe the disciples took his body. There was so much uncertainty. Every now and then somebody felt a bit of joy when they heard he's alive. But how? How is it possible? So before we continue to read the story in Luke 24, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that we can be in church on Resurrection Sunday talking about you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that your word is alive and active. We pray that you will speak to us this morning. May we leave here different to what we were when we came in. We open up our hearts to you and we say, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. So now imagine these two disciples, Cleopas and the other one, walking home to their small little town, this is what happened. In verse 13, that same day, two of Jesus' disciples were going to the village of Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. As they were talking and thinking about what had happened, Jesus came near and started walking along beside them. But they didn't know who he was. Just like everyone else on that day, people were talking about Jesus and everything that has happened. And then Jesus came and he joined them on their journey. Jesus wants to join you on your journey. And we're all on different journeys. We're in different places on our journeys. And maybe you here today and you are talking about Jesus and Christianity, but you don't really believe it all. I mean, you've met some amazing people who told you he's alive, and they're nice. And you know Easter is all about Jesus, and you have some family that serve him, but if you're talking about it and you're thinking about it, you're not sure Christianity is actually for you. Can I encourage you today that Jesus has joined your journey? Because when he sees even the slightest bit of openness towards him, when people start talking about him, or when they're curious, he comes and he joins us on our journey. James 4 verse 8 is one of my favorite verses. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Then in verse 17, Jesus asked them, what were you talking about as you walked along? The two of them stood there looking sad and gloomy. These two guys were sad. They had put their hope in Jesus, but now he's dead. Are you sad? Perhaps you're sad today because you've lost. Maybe you've, you've lost a loved one. I can sense that there's m- many in the room who have heavy hearts. Perhaps you're sad because of all the fighting in your home. Because you, maybe you're just sad because your children are making bad decisions. Maybe you're sad because you're in an abusive relationship. Maybe you're just sad. You actually don't even know why you're sad, but you're sad. Jesus noticed that these two disciples were sad. And he came alongside them, he came near, and Jesus notices that you are sad. Psalm 34 verse 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. How can he say this? How can he say that he saves those who are crushed in spirit? He can say it. 
because he has overcome absolutely every sickness, every pain, every relational struggle, any financial problem. He has overcame absolutely everything when he died on the cross. I love our theme verse for the year, John 16 verse 33. In this world, we will have trouble, but we can take heart for he has overcome the world. We serve a strong God and nothing is impossible for him. In verse 18, then the one named Cleopas asked Jesus, are you the only person from Jerusalem who didn't know what was happening there these last few days? Remember, they still don't know it's Jesus. eh? What do you mean? Jesus asked. Of course Jesus knew what they meant and what they were talking about. I mean, he's Jesus and he's all knowing. But see, Jesus loves it when we talk to him. He wants us to have conversation with him. He wants to talk to us and he wants us to talk to him. God knows our needs. He knows exactly what you need, but you have to tell him what you need. He wants us to speak to him. They answered, those things that happened to Jesus from Nazareth, by what he did and said, he showed that he was a powerful prophet who pleased God and all the people. Then the chief priests and our leaders had him arrested and sentenced to die. He died. He died on a cross. We had hoped that he would be the one to set Israel free. But it has already been three days since all this happened. These two disciples had hoped that Jesus would save Israel. But now they lost hope because Jesus was dead. Maybe you had hoped that your marriage would be great. But now it's not. And to be honest, you're losing hope for your marriage. Maybe you had hope that by Easter 2021, you would have your finances sorted out and that you would be out of debt, but you're not. And you're losing hope. Maybe you really had hoped that you'd be healed, that you'd be healthy by now. But you're not. Maybe you had hoped that You won't be so lonely anymore after isolation, but you're losing hope. Can I encourage you today that there is hope and hope is alive and his name is Jesus. Do not give up hope. Our Lord has risen and he's for you. He's not against you. He loves you with an everlasting love. Now the the two disciples continued to explain to Jesus everything that had happened that day. They said some women in our group surprised us. They had gone to the tomb early this morning, but did not find the body of Jesus. They came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who told them that he is alive. Some men from our group went to the tomb and found out, just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus either. Then Jesus asked the two disciples, why can't you understand? (laughs) How can you be so slow to believe all that the prophet said? Didn't you know that the Messiah would have to suffer before he was given to his glory? Verse 27, Jesus then explained everything written about himself in the scriptures, beginning with the law of Moses and the books of the prophets. These two disciples had questions. There are lots of questions. They didn't get it. God is not put off by your questions. Maybe you think your questions are arrogant or strange and you're wondering, why is this a sin? Or maybe you have questions like, out of all my friends, okay, why did it have to happen to me? Or maybe you have questions like, but if God is a good God, then why does bad things happen to good people? These two guys had questions, guy or girl, I don't know, two guys, we don't know, they were two disciples, Cleopas was a guy, but they had questions, they didn't get it, they didn't understand that Jesus had to suffer and die, they didn't understand that Jesus raising from the dead was all part of God's plan, so what Jesus did is he started explaining to them Everything about himself that was in the scriptures, that was the Old Testament. 
Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament. Moses pointed to Jesus. All the prophets spoke of him. But it can sometimes be hard to read the Old Testament, hey? You can sometimes read stuff and like, well, I don't know if this is, I don't know. I don't know what I'm reading. Especially if you're a new believer. Can I encourage you to, to start reading the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament. The, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the biographies of Jesus. It tells the stories of Jesus. And once you get to know Jesus more, then go to the Old Testament. Then you'll understand it a bit better. But I'm so excited because, you know, every Tuesday, first Tuesday of every month, we have Bible study with Paul. Every single first Tuesday. This Tuesday is Bible study with Paul, and Paul is going to do Jesus in the Old Testament. Isn't that exciting? Are you coming? It's going to be on YouTube and on Facebook. So not in person, but on YouTube and on Facebook. Lean in. It's going to be good. You're going to absolutely enjoy it. Verse 28. When the two of them came near the village where they were going, Jesus seemed to be going farther. They begged him, stay with us, it's already light, and the sun is going down. So Jesus went into the house to stay with them. Jesus sort of pretended to to, to, to continue, and they're like, no, Jesus, come with us. And Jesus went with them. Jesus wants you to invite him. Jesus wants you to invite him into your life. And he wants you to invite him into every aspect of your life. He wants to be part of your life, but you have to invite him in. Why? I mean, he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He can command that we all follow him. At the sound of his name, we could all just let him in. But love doesn't control. And God is love. And he's a gentleman. And what does he do? He waits for us to invite him in. Revelation 3 verse 20 says, look, I stand at the door and knock. He's waiting. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's been done to you. Grace is for everyone. That's why Jesus died, so that you could make it possible for you to come to him. In verse 30, after Jesus sat down to eat, he took some bread and blessed it and broke it. Then he gave it to them. Jesus was a guest, right? They invited him to their house. So why is Jesus now serving the bread? Huh? Shouldn't they have been taking the bread and breaking it and giving it to Jesus? When Jesus comes into our lives, He starts to lead. He's our leader. And he's a servant leader. But he's a strong leader. But he laid down his life for us. And here at Hope Church, we have a value that says we are servant leaders. It's one of our values, servant leadership. So when somebody puts up their hand and says, I want to be a small group leader, what we really hear them say is, I want to lay down my life for people. I want to serve people. And we're like, that's fantastic. That's what Jesus did. He gave us such a great example of what leadership looks like. He's a servant leader. He leads and he's strong, but he serves. I love what happens next. Verse 31, at once they knew who he was, <gasps> but he disappeared. <sighs> they said to each other, When he talked with us along the road and explaining the scriptures to us, didn't it warm our hearts? When the two disciples took bread, when they shared communion together, when they broke bread, God opened up their hearts and he revealed to them that it's him. Communion is powerful. We remember Jesus when we take communion together. Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. Just over two years ago, our family, myself, Paul, and our two teenage boys decided we are going to do communion every single day. Sometimes it's three minutes, sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's a bit longer, but we're going to remember Jesus every single day. The reason we started doing that is because we were all always sick. It always felt like somebody was sick, and we decided we're going to do communion every day and believe that by stripes we are healed. I remember those two years ago, I had such bad knees, 
And then I had to go for an operation and God actually has done incredible things in our family's life. We're not that sick anymore. I didn't even have a knee operation, but guess what? We found the healer. We mustn't just seek the healing, we must seek the healer. We know Jesus so much more. He's revealed himself to us so much more by sharing communion every single day. Can I encourage you to seek the blesser and not just the blessings? It's all about Jesus. And when we find Jesus, we have everything. You can take communion on your own. You can take communion at home. It's powerful. All we do is we remember what he's done for us. And he reveals himself to us. (gasps) Do you want to know him more? You know, something that really stands out to me about this story is that God is not a God of confusion. He's not a God of confusion. Whenever God sees sincere hearts, they may be confused, but he sees sincere hearts seeking. He will do whatever he can to reveal his will to them. God sees the questions. And he wants to give you clarity about who he is and what his will is for this world and for your life. How does God reveal his will? He revealed his will to these two disciples. And he reveals his will to us today, still in the same way. He reveals his will to us through his church. A big mistake these two disciples made is they disregarded what the woman told them. They say, Jesus is alive, but they didn't really believe it. Jesus spoke to people through women on the day that he raised from the dead. His plans haven't changed. God still speaks to believers through believers. And it can happen absolutely any time. It can happen while I'm speaking here. It can happen at small group in the week. It can happen straight after church when you get an ice cream. We're all getting ice creams today after church while you're eating your ice cream. Ola ice cream sponsored us with ice creams for the whole weekend. It's amazing. God reveals his will to us through his church. And that's why Satan does not want you in church. He doesn't want you to know God's will for your life. But God says we must be planted in his house and we will flourish. God also reveals his will to us through his word, the Bible. Hey, Jesus could have done absolutely anything when he rose from the dead. I think we all expected something a bit more dramatic, right? But he conducted a Bible study. (laughs) Not to a large crowd, just to two sort of unknown people on their way to a small town. If you want to know God's will for your life, spend time in the scriptures. Spend time reading his word. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I pray this for our sons every day. Lord, may your word be a light on their path, a lamp to their feet. May they know what your purposes are for their lives. God reveals his will for our lives when we walk with him. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus if you want to know his will for your life because he's a personal God. And he reveals his heart and his plans and his purposes to us as individuals as we walk with him daily, every day. You will never know God's will for your life if you just chat to him every now and then. You need to have a close relationship with him. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to talk to him. He wants to do life with you. And we know God's will through the fire of God. In verse 32, just after they realized it was Jesus, they asked each other, our hearts kept burning within us as he was talking to us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us, didn't they? God gave Jeremiah a fire for cold hearts. God gave Nehemiah a fire for a forgotten city. God gave Abraham a fire for a land he's never even seen. 
God gave David a fire for the name of God. So when Goliath mocked the name of God, Goliath stood up and he fought. Has God set your heart on fire? Is it for orphans? Is it for people who have never heard about the name of Jesus? Is it for business owners? Is it for high risk senior people living in our city? Jesus wants to set your heart on fire. And to discover the flame is to discover his will. Maybe there's not even a spark in your heart at the moment. But spend time with Jesus. Invite him in. Walk with him. Come to church. Spend time with other believers. Read his word. And that spark will become a flame that will become a raging fire for our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask that we all stand, please. I want to pray for two groups of people here today. Perhaps you're here and you haven't yet given your life to Jesus. We want to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to him today on Resurrection Sunday. And you'll be raised from death to life. And I want to pray for another group of people here that is saying, God, set my heart on fire. And I can know there are lots of people in this room. Across our other morning services, so many people said, Lord, I want to be on fire for you. So I'm going to ask that you close your eyes and bow your heads under the tent and in the auditorium here. If you want to give your life to Jesus today, can you raise your hand so I can just see who to include in this prayer? That's fantastic. I see your hands at the back there. More hands at the back. More hands at the back. <laughs> fantastic. So good. I see your hand in the front can take your hands down. I'm going to say a prayer. If you raise your hand, repeat this prayer after me, but the rest of us can just all pray together as well. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross. I now give my life to you. I have decided to be your child. I am inviting you in. And I'm excited to have you on my journey. You are now king, king of my life. If you're here this morning and you want to say, God, set my heart on fire, can you raise your hand so I can see you two included in this prayer? And so many hands are going up. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you've done on the cross. Thank you that you had a fire in your heart and you still have a fire in your heart for us, Lord God. Thank you that you love us so much and that your love is relentless, Lord Jesus. God, I pray for every person whose hand is raised right now, Lord, that you will reveal to them what it is you created them to do, Father God. Thank you that you have a good plan and a good purpose for every single person. We pray for everyone who's saying, Lord, set my heart on fire for you this morning, Lord. We pray that you'll speak to them. We pray that you will turn that spark into a flame, into a raging fire, Father God, and that their lives and our city and our world will never look the same again. In Jesus' name, we surrender. Have your way. Amen. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube channel. We really pray that you find it helpful in your journey. And we also really want to encourage you to take your next step by signing up to join a small group or to do discovery. Thanks again for watching and don't forget to subscribe and share this with as many people as possible. We really can't wait to see you next Sunday.